thank you very much. Um, first, to my colleagues um, in the UPND, in the UPND Alliance, and all the colleagues from the political side that are here, the public officers that are here, civil servants, others, the media, colleagues from the media, the fourth estate. Um, thank you for coming to this um, ceremony, swearing in ceremony for the Minister of Finance position, um, Dr. Stumbeko Msokotwane. First, I would like once more to congratulate you, Minister, for accepting being appointed and accepting to serve in this very important fundamental um, office critical to advancing the reason that the people of Zambia, especially the youth, voted us into office in a dramatic manner. This is the call of our agenda, the office of Minister of Finance is the call of our agenda to turn around this country's economy. You have vast experience in this area. And this stays with the theme of this government, one, to appoint people to positions based on the fact that they are Zambians. It doesn't matter their surname, it doesn't matter who their mother, who their father is, but they are citizens of Zambia. Number two, that they are competent. They bring merit to the table so we can deliver for the people of Zambia. And Dr. Musokutwane has vast experience. First, he's a Zambian. Two, he brings merit to this role. I've known this gentleman for many, many years. Lecturer in economics at the University of Zambia, Deputy Governor at Bank of Zambia, Special Assistant to the President for Economic Affairs, and the President, the late Mwanawasu. Could have been President Banda here. Secretary to the Treasury, Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet for Economics and Finance, Advisor to the IMF, and many other roles. I think the few that I have articulated, you can agree with me that because he's Zambian, he deserves the appointment. Because he qualifies, reinforces his appointment. And that will be the tradition of this government going forward. So when you see us taking a bit of time, it's because we, are, we want to do the right thing. We are stepping up the standards for public office bearers and what they intend to do for the people of Zambia. We believe, the people of Zambia believe that with your wealth of experience and competence, you will be able, with your team, with our team, in the line ministry, in other ministries, in the public service overall, the business community, the people of Zambia, because we all work as one towards an objective to serve the people better you will be able to deliver. First and foremost, we are taking over a country that is, whose treasure is empty. Empty. You may have not heard me. The treasure is empty. There is no money. That's why we failed to service our debt. We defaulted. So, we need to dismantle the debt mountain. We need a progressive budget that will begin to realign our 
way of managing public resources away from consumption, away from wastage, and more towards investment, towards revenue generation. Even with this empty treasury, we expect to drive this budget, he and his team, to send a message to the people of Zambia that there's a new way of doing business for the people of Zambia. Obviously, we need fiscal discipline. We need fiscal discipline. We need to be prudent. We need to always know that resources are scarce. And how we utilize the resources which are scarce will be critical to saving the people's hand. Flavorous expenditure has no room. Large delegation to meetings will not be there. Traveling on business class, first class, something many of us has, have never done for ourselves because now we work in government, we want to travel first class, business class. That will not be there. The minister knows the brief. Delegations will be smaller, only as necessary. As I said, resources are scarce. So if we preserve the resources, then we make them available to be spent in the areas that will better that child in school. The financial leakages, the bleeding going on, must be closed, must be patched up. It's patched a wound, wounds driven by the actions of the past. I don't want to waste time on that. And going forward, we don't open new wounds to cash out more blood. Citizens are hurting. We want to deal with financial, illicit financial flows. We want to deal with corruption. Zero tolerance to corruption, but not driven on vindictive lines, but allowing the institutions with that mandate, legal mandate, on behalf of the people of Zambia to fight corruption. Do it professionally, give them political will, but allow them to work independent. Breath of fresh air. We want to rebuild the fiscus, drive decentralization. In this first budget, instrument for generating revenue, directing expenditure, I expect the minister and his team to begin to drive money away from the gluttonous behavior around Lusaka, the tendering processes around Lusaka, and take the money to the owners, those who voted for us, the citizens, the woman who has to walk five kilometers, 10 kilometers to draw water. She has water on her head, firewood on her shoulder, a young baby on her back, and on the other hand, she's pulling an infant. It is your duty, Minister, it's our duty to provide water for that woman, that mother, so she can walk a shorter distance to draw water. That's why we want to realign money from consumption, wastage, theft. Let's put it simply, theft so that woman can have water. Decentralization, devolution, allow people to make decisions, priority, different priorities in the localities they live in. Foster economic growth, obviously for what? Food, said it, consistent with our integration speech. Food for the people, affordable food, jobs, business opportunities, education for our people, those who want it, who deserve it health service delivery. This is what this portfolio is all about. And you will be supported by all of us, including our office. And I indeed believe other ministries. Let me just close by saying, 
appointing the Minister of Finance first and alone makes some people nervous. And some people are saying, I'm waiting for too long for my appointment. We're sending a message that first is to reconstruct the economy. Then we can look at social services and fund social services. You can't advance consumption before you advance revenue generation. Simple, isn't it? Very simple. So he has to work on a budget. We are in a hurry. The budget has a calendar. He comes in first. Straight takes charge of the Minister of Finance, takes charge of the Bank of Zambia, takes charge of the Zambia Revenue Authority, takes charge of parastatus. It doesn't matter through which channel. Ultimately, the shareholder, on behalf of the people of Zambia, for all parastatus quasi-government, is the Minister of Finance. So, sir, that's why you've come in first. Others will follow rapidly. Be patient. No worry. We're organized. We're methodical. Very soon you'll see the benefit of that. You're already seeing order in the markets. Councils are beginning to generate revenue. Order. Councils generate revenue. We don't want them to be the new misusers of resources. They must deliver services to the citizens, to the residents of towns. They must clean toilets in markets, water in the markets. Garbage must be collected. Salaries must be paid. Easy, isn't it? Methodical. Please be patient with us. I see social media getting impatient. Be patient with us. Minister, once more congratulations. Your shoulders must be tough to carry the burden, the expectations from the people. But you will be okay. You have our support. You have the water support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, ST and uh, your colleagues from within the Ministry of Finance, colleagues from ZRA, colleagues from Bank of Zambia, uh, members of the press. I shall be brief, even the questions will be brief, because as you can see, the atmosphere where we are in today is not conducive in this COVID uh, environment. We are making arrangements so that we can find a more conducive solution uh, in the future briefings. Having said that, I uh, want to say that I'm extremely delighted to be back at the Ministry of Finance. This is the fourth time that I'm becoming a member of the team of the Ministry of Finance. First time was when I just graduated from the university in 1979. My first job ever was uh, here at the Minister of Finance. I came back later as uh, advisor to Minister Katele Kalumba during the PRSP days, you remember, RST. Yes. Then I was back as Secretary to the Treasury. I was back as Minister of Finance and I'm back again as a Minister of Finance. So I'm not totally lost. There are a few changes that have taken place uh, physically and uh, uh, also in terms of ideas, but I have a very good understanding of this place because of the history that I've just indicated. I also want to thank uh, the President, uh, President Ichilema, for showing confidence that he can come back to the Minister of Finance to lead his economic team. And all I can say is that I will not disappoint him and I will not disappoint the people of Zambia. We are here to do great things as an economic team under his administration. I'll come back to that point in a while in the meantime, I want to say that uh, the ministry that I'm coming to is obviously uh, quite different from the one I left in 2011 in terms of the economic environment that we are experiencing as a country today. The economic environment meaning that the cost of living is escalated beyond what we had uh, imagined. Obviously, uh, the exchange rate, where it is today, or where it had reached, none of us ever dreamt that a dollar one day would cost even 20 quarter. Because those days, if it reached five or even six, there would be panic. Uh, but today, we that is the situation. The dollar has become very expensive. But all this really, in summary is that the people of Zambia are stressing economically, the people of Zambia are stressing. I must also add that uh, this stress, this economic stress has its roots here in the Ministry of Finance. The stress arises from the fact that Zambia over a relatively short period of time has just borrowed too much money borrow too much money, meaning that as we pay back there's little liquidity for those running businesses to have customers, meaning that it has become hard for the government to hire essential workers such as teachers, health workers, or indeed even to provide uh, meaningful salary increments to the workers of the public service. So that's the difference that I come to, which was not there before. And it is this difference, it is this stress that has led the people of Zambia, more especially the youth, more especially the youth, to say to our colleagues, the one who were in charge before, please go and take a rest. Let's try a different team. Therefore, this administration, we are focusing 
or we are going to focus a lot in economic issues. We don't care much about how your nose looks like. We don't care much about whether you are tall or short. We don't care much about what language you speak. That is not our politics. Our politics is what can we do to reduce and to remove the stress that the people of Zambia are experiencing. How can we create jobs, jobs for the millions of youth who are roaming the streets, starting from those who have just ended grade 7, grade 9, grade 12, university graduates, because unemployment is now right across the whole spectrum of society. So our focus will be how to generate, not how to generate, but to generate jobs for the young people through, number one, those where government is able to hire or should hire, like teachers and uh, health workers, within our means, we are going to put a lot of, we are going to put some steam into that. We know that there are about 50,000 trained teachers alone who are out there looking for jobs in their teaching service. And indeed, those jobs are necessary. Those of us running rural constituencies, we know that teachers are desperately needed. So we'll do something about that problem so that perhaps in the next five years, we can get back to normal whereby essential workers, such as teachers, health workers, are employed and put on payroll. That is the contribution of the uh, government. But there's a limit to which government can do to absorb the youth of the state. How many teachers can we employ? How many policemen can we employ? These are just thousands. But we know there are millions of young people looking for jobs. And those jobs must come from the private sector. So you see what we are going to do. We are going to do a lot to drive up the agenda in the private sector. We will push hard to make sure that our mining sector expands. The mining output has been stuck for the last 10 years at about 800,000 metric tons of copper per year. We are going to push aggressively so that mining output in the next 10 years comes to something like 3 million tons. By the end of the, this current mandate, we want to push mining output to something close to 2 million tons per annum from 800,000. Why? Because mining, as you know, is the one that gives foreign exchange, is the one that gives some employment, is the one that provides employment in the main sectors that are related to mining, transport, banking, insurance, repairs, spares, construction, all those are related to mining. So we are going to push very hard for the mining sector. And the good thing is that the price of copper is projected to remain high for many, many years. It's going to be the new oil. In the 1970s, oil was the in thing. Now copper is the in thing because cars are no longer going to be used petrol. They are moving towards uh, electrical uh, systems. So we are going to push the production of copper by creating a good environment for more investments to be, to be done. And you'll be amazed how much foreign exchange this country is going to make with this price of copper. You will not, you will not know what to do with the dollars that this country will be receiving. Our problem may be just be the dollar becoming too cheap as we drive this process. We are going to make sure that there is value addition we are going to persuade credible investors to put investments into these multi facility economic zones, which have been dormant in the last 10 years, so that in those emphases, we can draw copper wires, 
in those emphases we can do copper alloys you see like that lock there the one that looks like gold that's a copper alloy copper mixed with something else which currently is imported our job is to make sure that items like those items like fridges which are a result of copper items like starter motors we are going to push to make sure that those populate the special or mouth facility economic zones so that you, the young people, have a wider choice of jobs to get into. These juices that we import from South Africa, whether it is mango juice, whether it is orange juice, whether it is purple juice, we want to be the ones exporting those items into South Africa, into Europe, into the Americans. So there's going to be aggression to make sure that we produce these items in large quantities, very process within Zambia, and export. So this cotton, we will make sure that our farmers would get good incentives to grow cotton so that it is spun here. Out of that, we make cloth. Out of that, we are the ones to be exporting jeans, t-shirts, shirts, bed sheets, and so forth. So this is just a brief flavor of the agenda that we have to drive the economy to grow. Ten years ago, people were saying economic growth doesn't matter. Now you've seen for yourself what happens when there's no economic growth. You've seen for yourself when they have negative economic growth. Look at the poverty that is there. That is emerged. Because when there is no growth, it simply means there is no. The earning power of the country is uh, going backwards. And when the earning power of the country is going backward, what it means that on average, on average, each one of us will be poorer than before. That's why these economists will tell you that the per capita GDP or the average income per person. It has gone down, and that's not surprising because the growth of the economy has done what? It's taken a nose knife. So our challenge is to stop the economy declining, put it in the opposite direction very aggressively, and I want to say we are benchmarking, our, we are benchmarking ourselves very aggressively. Benchmarking means what we intend to be in the next 10, 15 years. We want to be like Mauritius, we want to be like Malaysia, we want to be like Thailand, so that the wheels of the economy grow. We, it's no longer about saying uh, we want economic growth, but really we want to transform. So this is what the, pres uh, the leadership of President Hakainde is bringing to the table, how to transform this economy beyond anything that we've ever seen before. It's a very aggressive, very aggressive. Now, to our, my colleagues here in the Minister of Finance, you've got a flavor of what we're aiming at. And we are the ones to facilitate that by making sure that money that is wasted in frivolous things is now invested into things that matter. When I talk about, for example, uh, when I talk about uh, producing three million tons of copper, there is a role for government, there is a role for private sector. Our role as government is to make sure that there is infrastructure going to where copper ores are discovered. You can't say there's copper there, but there's no road going there, there's no power going there, Yes, copper is there, but you will not be able to mine. When we are talking about tourism, it's no good to say we have animals, we have Victoria Falls, we have uh, this and that. These items are in the bush. How do you go into Lua, where I come from, and say, uh, want tourists, where are they going to sleep? Under the tree? Yes, they can sleep under the tree, but they will leave very little money. 
So the idea is to make sure that infrastructure, which is the responsibility of government, ST, goes to where it can unlock investment. That's our duty at the Minister of Finance. Our duty is to make sure that we collect taxes so that we can train our people, train the young people, they are skilled, so that all these investments that we are talking about, the Zambians are not bystanders. The Zambians are participants because they can supply, they can work, pro provide professional services. So that is the agenda, Mr. Uh, ST. The money is going to be utilized carefully on things that assist the social sector, on things that generate more revenue for the country so that growth keeps on exploding. Wastage is to come to the end. As you see me here, I say that the 10 years when I was a private member of parliament representing a rural constituents, for me that was very good training. Very good training because I've, when we talk about shortage of teachers, I've seen it. Schools where I went, primary school where I went before going to secondary in uh, Hillcrest and Livingston. That primary school today is a basic school. But the number of teachers who are there are less than the number of teachers who were there when it was only up to grade seven. <coughs> so that's why you heard the president talking about taking money to where it belongs. That is us here, the Minister of Finance, no useless seminars, no useless trips, because that money must be saved to go to where the rural people are suffering. Things that I've seen with my own eyes in the last 10 years. Many of you have never slept in a swamp. I've slept in a swamp. Maybe one of these days we should go and sleep in a swamp. <laughs> so that you see uh, what we are talking about. Um, issues of corruption. No one will protect you. If you are found in corruption, straight away to ACC. No one will protect you. So if there were schemes like that, say bye-bye to them. Issues of failing to deliver service. Come tomorrow, come tomorrow. License is taking seven years to produce. I've seen situations like that. We are going to agree, ST. We we'll call the private sector. What kind of services do we deliver here? ABC. We we'll agree that if an application for a particular license or something like that, if all the paperwork is correct, we have to commit ourselves that within X number of days, without question, this service must be delivered. If we don't deliver, the one who is supposed to deliver on that, we have to answer questions, serious questions, serious questions. Commissioner General, I believe you've already started some of those things, but we are going to push very hard to make sure that we provide service to the people of Zambia. Let me end here because I've actually gone beyond what I'd intended. <laughs>